Welcome to the fourth podcast in the series, Creating an Organizational Culture that Promotes Recovery and the Implementation of Psychiatric Rehabilitation. My name is Daniela labate Cavelli. In today's podcast, we hear from Paul Margulies and Paula Fries. Paula is the recently retired Chief Operating Officer at a behavioral health agency in Long Island, New York. Today, she and Paul will talk about the journey that Paula's agency went through to create a culture that truly promotes recovery and psychiatric rehabilitation practices and principles. Paul, I'd like to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself and get us started. Thanks, Daniela. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Margulies. I'm an associate director of the Center for Practice Innovations. I'm also a clinical psychologist, and my first uh, introduction to psychiatric rehabilitation was in 1981, when I was first trained by Bill Anthony and his staff up at Boston University. Uh, Paula, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula Fries. I am the recently retired Chief Operating Officer from the Association for Mental Health and Wellness. And um, I've also been working in, you know, behavioral health and mental health for close to 40 years, but I started it at um, Clubhouse of Suffolk, as it was formerly known, in 1993, and I went there to open the first IPRT in Suffolk County. You will hear a lot about what intensive psychiatric rehabilitation treatment programs were, because that's the foundation for most of the psych rehab training throughout the state and also what got incorporated into the PROS programs when they evolved. I am a licensed creative arts therapist and I'm passionate about creativity and healing and bringing that into everything I do in treatment, in um, teaching, especially around psych rehab. So that's a little bit about me and you'll get to know me better through the training. So Paula, here's my first question. You know, we talked in our webinar about three kinds of change evolutionary change, which is gradual and incremental, strategic change, which is planned and we feel we have at least a little bit of control over it, and shock change, which is often unexpected and sometimes unwanted. How did your organization experience these changes? As a leader, many changes feel strategic with plans and timelines and conscious efforts to make things different. Our organization experienced a whole series of changes in the 30 years that I was there. We went from clubhouse to IPRT, to pros, to a peer run center, and then we had to adjust to COVID in 2020. I first went to work for the Association for Mental Health and Wellness, but it was called Clubhouse of Suffolk at that time, and it was modeled after the Fountain House program in New York City. I came on board when it was two years old to start the IPRT, which stands for Intensive Psychiatric Rehabilitation Treatment Program. In 1993, and it was the first IPRT in Suffolk County, my exposure to psych rehab was through OMH and BU presentations, originally with Bill O'Brien, who was my mentor and trainer, and then the subsequent co-trainers. I was hired to expand the organization from one program to provide psych rehab-based experiences throughout the organization. The next level was to support the organization moving from contract-driven payment towards the PROS model in 2007 and leverage how Medicaid would finance those services. This shift in funding caused many organizations to cut back services throughout New York State. In 2015, the Clubhouse of Suffolk fully merged with two other not-for-profits, the Mental Health Association in Suffolk County and Suffolk County United Veterans. And we rebranded to the Association of Mental Health and Wellness. We intentionally worked with staff to utilize and incorporate the psych rehab technology principles and approach into the other programs. Seven years ago, we got funding to have a peer run program without walls. And that was the RCE, which was based in the community and not site based Peers planned and organized programs and activities to get together in the community at large. The clinical services embedded in the program were vibrant and exciting but there was a shift in people coming to receive services over the past five years before and during COVID. So one of the things we had to do was really to adapt to the changing needs of the people who were coming to us for services. The shock change that no one planned for was COVID. We had to immediately shift how to meet the needs of the participants at that time. 
And in doing so, we actually learned an awful lot. That's quite the history. So throughout all these years, how did staff experience these changes and how did you help them to adjust to the changes? I was the original staff person to create the IPRT and then went out and hired the staff. So I was charged with bringing and onboarding those individuals who were going to work with me side by side in developing the IPRT. I had strict guidelines and technology and methodology to live up to for the expectations of Boston University. I made hiring people with lived experience part of the values of the program. And that actually comes from us starting out as a clubhouse. The model is hire people and have people work side by side with you who also have lived experience. So I look for people who had passion and belief that people can and do recover from serious mental illness and who want to get on with their lives, not only for themselves, but also in the people who I would hire as IPRT staff. Our culture was on embracing change and focusing on the needs of the people we served. We always had people that questioned how the change would affect themselves and were resistive to change, but oftentimes these are natural responses to change. It's not unusual for people to say, no, I don't want anything to change, yet also somewhere inside also desire, I need something new. It is important to make a conscious effort to be transparent and discuss the winds of change that are affecting us in the course of the world we are working in. One thing that came out of the clubhouse model is that you don't go through, you don't do things to people and you work through them with through changes. And that means not only people who work with you, but also the people who provide services to. The way you do that is by including them in the process, such as through dialogue and evaluation. Ultimately, leadership needs to make the final decisions to say what direction the organization is going through in the change period. I believe that the use of the PDS model, Plan, Do, Study, Act, is important to help things with people and not to people. And I believe that also supports in the psych rehab approach, the um, stages of change. So throughout our changes, there was a consistent culture in the organization that was supportive of the change towards recovery and psychiatric rehabilitation. Organizational culture is a major responsibility of leadership, and it is influenced by communication, the values that are embraced, and the ways that they connect with staff and the criteria in hiring staff. It is important to be transparent in the direction of the organization so staff can choose also if they want to be a part of it or not. And that's true also with the people who receive services from you. You need to be open and, and authentic about what are what direction an organization is going to. And is it a match? So it sounds like you place an emphasis on taking a very conscious effort to choose the right qualities of staff at the point of hire when you're first hiring them. Yes, um, as much as possible. And when we were a smaller organization, um, going back to the beginning, and we actually incorporated and used and had the people who provided, or I'm sorry, the members of our organization, the people who received services from us as part of the interview process. When I first came to work for um, Club of Suffolk, I had a group of members who interviewed me. It was a group interview process, and I was both incredibly amazed by it but also found it profoundly um, rewarding. That doesn't happen today as much, mostly because the organization is so large and um, COVID impacted that in a very profound way when we had to pivot and go remote. Um, and so we're in the process of bringing a lot of that back as we move back to being in-person services, especially around hiring and bringing in the people who receive services to us. The most important piece in the hiring process is the discussion of whether the applicant believes that people can recover and get on with their lives, such as what we call as going to work or school, um, what are the roles they want for themselves, and where do they see themselves in the future. We look for that passion about supporting, not fixing, or doing things for people. We look for people that let their clients be in the driver's seat. Secondly, an organization can't be afraid to take risks or not have all the answers, but a willingness to find out in an ethical and conscious framework. It is important to take thoughtful risk, not unmitigated risk. Also, don't be afraid to build the airplane as you fly it. We say that a lot in my organization. 
The leader must be able to tolerate the risks and the unknown to guide the organization and the staff through the process. And this takes courage. Another analogy is whitewater rafting. You know where you wanna go, but you don't know the rocks that are beneath the water. Leadership needs to be alert and move with the current as you notice the rocks. You know, I think whitewater rafting is absolutely the perfect image for what I think your organization and so many have been through you know, over, over the years. You know, back to the webinar again, you may recall we talked about, you know, the life cycle of organizations, you know, that there are three phases of change, the formative, which is kind of like the startup, the normative, where you find your groove, you're consistent, you want to be, you know, making sure that the services you provide are always the best services and always done in a very consistent way. And then the trans formational, the transformative, that at, at this stage, you're needing to reinvent yourself because the environment around you changes. And every organization is faced with that ultimate, you know, uh, transformational, transformative uh, stage. For you, how did leadership go through these stages? And how did they support staff to go through them as well? Well, sometimes the organization can find different parts of it going through different stages of change in areas of the organization at the same time. You can have formative stages happening, mostly it's normative, and then there's the transformative piece. They need to be open and transparent as possible with staff about what stage you're in. Some details may not be as broad um, or may be able to be shared, but it is important to communicate changes with both staff and the people that we are serving. Succession planning is an important part of the lifestyle of, of an organization, and it is important to be able to pivot when challenges arise. We were going through and doing some succession plan, planning and strategic planning around changes in leadership during um, right before COVID happened. But then it did uh, COVID when COVID came on, it had caused some changes in those plans. We were in the process of our CEO at the time was planning on retiring at the end of of uh, 2021, and then COVID hit in March of 2020. So when we hired a new CEO, I worked side by side to help with that transition process. And that's why I actually hired, uh, retired only recently. I was able to be there for the two and a half years that our new CEO was, uh, was um, onboarded and be able to assist with that process of transition and causes the least disruption as possible to our organization. Paula, with all the changes that you've seen and been through, what strengths of your organization helped with the change? And also, what were the barriers and stumbling blocks that you faced and had to work through? I feel that our biggest strength was our longevity and experience in mid-level and executive leadership. Uh, we were really blessed with having many of the people in the leadership roles with us for 20 years or longer. They knew the history of the organization and they were not afraid to ask questions and challenge ideas. We did not experience high turnover in many positions, but that did lead to some stagnation in the smaller parts of the agency. Sometimes we needed to discuss where staff would be going next. COVID froze many transitions. It moved people off site, and then we had to plan how everyone, staff included, um, along with members, how everybody would come back to uh, being in person. We lost a lot of staff during part of this transition in the last three years for a variety of different reasons. And we needed to be um, understanding and accepting of that because we were going through that shock change, that transformative change. As an organization, we listened to the needs and wants of the people we served and they stated that they wanted in-person services and in-person programs again. We believe that our programs couldn't become fully operational until all staff were vaccinated to establish as safe an environment as possible. We mandated vaccines to work at the organization. And because of that, we did lose some people um, in that mandate process. In many ways, we have gone back to looking for people who have passion and energy for the work we also um, have experienced some of what, you know, everybody refers to as the great resignation. But I do think some of it was about people started to reevaluate where am I at in my life and where do I want to go? We look for candidates who believe and hold hope for people more than the degrees they hold. Now we are rethinking what works for our organization 
and are reorganizing accordingly. So here's such an important question. How do you encourage change in staff? You know, as leadership, how does leadership support change in their staff? Well, I'm a firm believer in that you must model it in yourself and be open to listening if something isn't working. You can't take it personally if someone doesn't like change that's happening and be willing to step back and reevaluate. Too much change at one time can also get exhausting. I realized that through understanding the concept of readiness for change from psych rehab, we were able to apply that to our organization. So understanding the stages of change and knowing, you know, you know, pre-contemplation, contemplation, and as you move through into action, but also understanding not everybody's going to keep pace with you, not everybody's going to be in the same place at the same time. This concept of readiness for change works for the client, the staff, and the organization. We found that it gave us guide points along the way. Also, it is important for you to share your own willingness to change. You can't be afraid of that change or the mistakes you might make along the way. Mistakes will be made. It is important to know how to learn and grow from them. Hopefully, people will come along with you. It is important to check if the change matches the staff and let it be okay if they can't make that change and look for elsewhere um, for a job or a new career opportunity. You need to focus on the direction that brings life and energy to the organization so you don't get stagnant. So can you tell us about any policy changes, training initiatives, evaluations, you know, supervision changes, whatever it is that happened within the organization to help promote these kinds of changes? Well, we are now over 33 years old as an organization, as the Association for Mental Health and Wellness. And as the organization got older, we got better at these things. I think one of the biggest things we really looked towards adopting and providing support and training around was really good supervision. And we also um, really embraced adopting and looking at things from quality management or quality improvement perspective. And that's really important. Blending this and the psychiatric rehabilitation approach and principles prove very valuable. It is also important to be a good steward around taxpayer dollars and participant needs. PROS was very helpful in the supervision of these characteristics and creating our policies required team input. I just wanna point out that the elements for a successful business, regardless of theme, is important for the organization staff and customers to thrive. So not only also, I wanna emphasize here that developing policies and procedures Though you may follow a regulatory framework, such as the pros licenses, but also getting the input and participation from the people you serve is, um, is critical because they're the ones who are receiving the services and they can give you really sound feedback about is the quality there? Is it working? Let's talk about supervision. How deliberate were you in providing supervision around psychiatric rehabilitation? Was it very deliberate? Was it focused? How did that all work? One of the things that's really appreciated is that supervision is naturally built or was naturally built into the IPRT program, and it's built into the PROS programs. The concepts can get diluted over time, especially as you have staff turnover, um, et cetera. So the ability to come back to that is important. So one of the ways we approach that um, was by creating and developing um, team model approach or team leaders approach. Supervision can be both administrative and clinical, develop the skills of the practitioner, but we also developed, as I said, small teams with a team leader to help foster that growth and development. And the team leaders were people who developed leadership skills. They weren't necessarily the person who had the highest degree level, they were the people who demonstrated and, and showed that they had the ability to inspire and lead others. To capitalize on people's strengths, we let them show different responsibilities for different parts of the program. One of the things I can say about supervision is that it was naturally built into the IPRT program and was also continued in the PROS programs. The concepts can get diluted over time, so the ability to come back to them is important. And by concepts, I mean psychiatric rehabilitation concepts. 
Supervision can be both administrative and clinical to develop the skills of the practitioner. One of the approaches we took from a very early stage in the PROS programs was we developed small teams with a team leader to help foster that growth and development amongst the practitioners and the staff. One of the things we also were very conscious of that often in crisis, supervision and training can go out the window. Supervision takes time and investment and it is important to make it routine. I, you know, oftentimes people are like, well, we can cancel supervision this week because this is more important. You have to be very conscious of that and try to avoid that as much as possible. It must be tailored to the person and provided on a weekly, bi-weekly or monthly basis, but it does need to be scheduled and it needs to be also designed according to the need of the staff member um, who you're supervising. And one of the other things too is group supervision can also work very, very well. In summary, it is one thing to implement something. It is also very different to sustain it over time. And I believe that through policies and supervision, that helps to sustain a direction and um, a model such as psychiatric rehabilitation for the long haul. Paula, we've left the most important and maybe even most difficult question for last. And here's the question. <laughs> How do you measure success? Well, that is the ultimate question. That's what our funders ask. That, that's what, um, you know, when you go after grants, they all want to know what are your outcomes and the payers, what are your outcomes? So you can measure data and outcomes, but sometimes that doesn't give the whole story. You have to add to that um, the story of people. There can be more anecdotal stories in sharing a person's personal feelings of success. When the people who come to us are in pain and begin to identify and express what they want for themselves, that's the beginning of the story. I have seen many people who never thought they could get a GED, could go to college or to get a job, be successful in doing just that. I have seen people who never thought they could move out from their parents' homes, do so and do well on their own. I have seen people with substance abuse histories Co-occurring disorders go on to be able to live without the substance, to get a job, and to reconnect with their family. For staff, when they connect with a partnership relationship, instead of telling a client what to do or developing the goal plan, all the I have tos taken to, like a note or a treatment plan become real and come together. You are taking the journey together with the person who is receiving the services. Another way to measure the success of an organization is to do annual surveys. Get, ask people to give you feedback and do it anonymously. It is important to weave in an annual survey of staff in addition to the recipients. This way you can get a better sense on the status and the direction of the organization. And don't be afraid of negative feedback. That really is important. That helps you know what do we have to do to course correct. This brings us to the end of today's discussion. Paula, thanks so much for sharing all of this with us. Oh, you're welcome. And there's more to tell. Thanks so much, Paul and Paula. Paula, I wanna particularly thank you for sharing the journey that Clubhouse of Suffolk, now the Association for Mental Health and Wellness has been on over the last 30 plus years. You've given us a really clear picture of what culture change can look like, both for practitioners in programs and services, as well as for the people that we support. If we go through the process of psychiatric rehabilitation along with the people we support, we can make incredible change and progress. Thank you all for listening.